Well, alrighty, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Carrier by Sophie Hanna. So this is currently the book I am reading, so this is going to be a bit more of a like vlog style review where I update you throughout the days. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, but then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. An overnight plane delay is bad. Having to share your hotel room with a stranger is worse. But that is only the beginning of Gabby Struther's problems. Gabby has never met Lauren Cookson. So how does Lauren say much about her? How does she know that the love of Gabby's life has been accused of murder? Why is she telling her that he is innocent? And why is she so terrified of Gabby? Now, that does kind of happen, but not necessarily in that order as well. It's a very confusing plot, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I'll go through and share what I can with you. So this is right at the beginning. Police exhibit transcript of handwritten letter from Kerry Jose to Francine Breary, dated 14th of December, 2010. And she begins with, why are you still here, Francine? I've always believed that people can will their own deaths. If our minds can make us wake up exactly a minute before our alarm clocks are due to go off, they must be capable of stopping our breath. Think about it, brain and breath are more powerfully linked than brain and bedside table. A heart begged to stop by a mind that won't take no for an answer. What chance does it stand? That's what I've always thought, anyway. And that's kind of relevant to the plot later on, you know? Great little quote, there's nothing like an airport for making you lose faith in humanity. Yeah, I will agree with that, I hate airports. I like travelling, but I don't like airports, and people in airports, and just people. And we sort of get this little bit of philosophy where, where uh, the main character, she's going, actively doing harm to someone is more morally culpable than failing to step in and prevent harm done by others, right? The difference between positive and negative responsibility, sins of commission versus sins of omission, yes? I don't know how I feel about that. I think they're both probably equally bad. And Charlie says, Did you know opera singers repeat tongue twisters before concerts to make their lips more flexible? I heard it on the radio. I've heard that too, so I assume it's true. Great little paragraph here of Charlie's inner monologue. The thing about people who hate themselves, Charlie thought, is that you totally identify and sympathise at the same time as massively not wanting them as house guests. Don't you think it's weird that the expression son of a bitch is so well known, but no one ever calls anyone a daughter of a bastard, she asked, looking around. All responses welcome, the more the merrier. Is it some kind of odd sexism, do you think? Great little definition here. A tyrant is anyone whose death would free somebody, even only one person. And we get a reference to the Dower House. Um, and it says, She'd asked a member of staff about the hotel's name and ended up on the receiving end of a social history lecture that was long, tedious and mildly offensive, and that it took for granted that everybody came from a wealthy country estate-owning family, though both the woman delivering the lecture and Charlie, the only two participants in the conversation, quite clearly did not. Still, it was thanks to that woman's memorable pretentiousness that Charlie now knew that a dower house was where an estate owner's wife moved when she was widowed, once the estate owner had died and the larger manor house had to be passed on to the son and heir. Interesting, didn't know that. We get a reference to murder on the Orient Express and uh, uh, people saying maybe that's kind of the solution to this, this case. And I just think that's interesting because uh, Sophie Hanna is like officially uh, allowed by the Christie estate to write the uh, Agatha Christie sort of sequels slash continuations. So that was cool. Great little line here. Life punishes the needy. Admit you can't live without something and it's taken away. And I thought this was just interesting too on the subject of love. Does Dan think it's strange that I still love Tim? Yes, it's been years, but it's excessive proximity, not separation, that wears love away. And I never really had Tim. He wasn't mine. My craving for him was never satisfied. That's not love, that's need. Addiction. And so this is a, a bit of to toxic femininity here. And a confident, successful woman like Gabby Struthers had put up with this non-physical affair, aka total waste of time. Charlie tried to suppress her irritation. Why couldn't someone tell men like Simon and Tim Brewery that blokes were supposed to want sex all the time with anyone, irrespective of the consequences? What was the point of being a man if you couldn't comply with that basic rule? Traitors to their gender, that's what they were. That doesn't make me like you, Charlie. We get this incredible little discussion here. Do you want to start race rights in the Culver Valley Waterhouse? Is that what you're trying to do? What did race have to do with it? Simon said nothing. He'd fallen into enough of Proust's traps in the past to know the warning signs. An obtrusive non secateur was the verbal equivalent of flashing neon. Because if you carry on in this vein, I'm going to pitch myself out the window. People will film me on their mobile phones and the local news will get hold of the story. And then the national news and everyone will think Spilling Police Station has been attacked by a jihadi hijacked plane. Which will fuel both Islamophobia and Islamic extremism. All that will be your fault, Waterhouse. Bit of a stretch. And we learn that Tim could live quite happily in prison, uh, more so than most people. He doesn't give two hoots about his physical surroundings, as long as there are books there. He'd have a prescribed routine, plenty of time to read, lots of people to charm and impress, and, crucially, proof that he's a bad guy. 
I think he'd find that comforting. And we get someone saying, we're his rock. And then Charlie wonders, why was it always a rock? Were rocks particularly helpful to ordinary people in urban and suburban settings? Why did no one say, he's my central heating or he's my fitted carpet? And we learn that Simon, when he's having sex, he pretends that he's someone else, which is quite sad. Uh, but yeah, The Carrier by Sophie Hanna, that's about all I have to tell you about this one. Um, it's already at the point, it's been a couple of weeks since, since I finished this one, and I, I don't particularly remember it too much. I think that generally is a problem for me with crime thrillers. Um, a lot of them just merge into each other, and I don't think this one particularly stands out in the genre. However, it's competently written enough. I do enjoy reading Sophie Hanna. I'd give it a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5, and if, you're, if you've been reading Sophie Hanna and you enjoy her stuff, or if you want to try a new crime writer, you could do a lot worse than this one. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Carrier by Sophie Hanna. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this one and if so, what you th think slash thought. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.